Major funding for Frontline is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Tonight on Frontline, the Catholic Church locked in a struggle for power, a struggle for faith. I have to ask myself, why do I stay within the Catholic Church? Rome, I think, is, is trying to, to grab power again. We are loyal to His Holiness, Pope John Paul II, and we lament what has happened in our country. Tonight, a report on the conflict between the Pope in Rome and Catholics in America is nothing sacred. From the network of public television stations, a presentation of KCTS Seattle, WNET New York, WPBT Miami, WTVS Detroit, and WGBH Boston, this is Frontline with Judy Woodruff. Good evening. Is nothing sacred? That's a familiar phrase which has taken on a new and deeper meaning for American Catholics ever since the controversial Second Vatican Council ended 20 years ago. The Vatican Council promised to open the Church to new ideas and change, but that was the last thing many Catholics wanted, and the conflict that resulted turned the Church inside out, dividing Catholics, especially Catholics in the United States. What does it mean to be both Catholic and American, to try to be faithful to the authoritarian traditions of the Church while living in a democratic society. Once, Catholics seemed to speak with one voice. Now, the oldest, biggest church in the world finds there are many Catholic voices, as producer Irv Drasnan reports in his film on Catholics in America. I thank you, dear God, with all my For members of the only true faith, this is a rite of passage. These third graders are preparing for First Communion, the most sacred expression of a faith held by more than 50 million American Catholics. What it means to live and die a good Catholic has been argued and questioned for almost 2,000 years. Traditionally, the answers have been found here in Rome. In all that time, whether threatened by outsiders with persecution and war, or from within by heresy and schism, the Church has survived standing as a fortress on the rock where the first Pope, Peter, received the keys to the kingdom of heaven. The way to heaven, life everlasting, that's the spiritual power of the church, based on scripture, divine revelation, and ritual. And on the supreme authority of the Bishop of Rome, the successor to St. Peter who speaks for God on earth, the Pope. On matters of doctrine, discipline, and moral teachings, the Pope reigns over the Western world's oldest institutional bureaucracy, a power structure that's remained unmoved since the Middle Ages, the hierarchy of cardinals, to archbishops and bishops, and through them to the clergy and below, to the laity, the people. That power has been challenged in the past, and again in the past 20 years since the Second Vatican Council, Vatican II, 
called by some the most important religious event of this century. The purpose of Vatican II, to change a church that had resisted change for hundreds of years, to bring an ancient church into the modern world. Recepti salutari vus moniti. The power of the Roman Catholic Church is embodied in the Pope. To be Catholic has meant to accept his absolute authority. Intentionally or not, the central issue of Vatican II became one of authority. Whether power would be shared in a more democratic church whose policies could change, or whether a conservative hierarchy could defend its privileged position. It may not always be apparent here in St. Peter's, but the call to reform the church started a revolution within the church, a struggle for power that became as well a struggle for faith. The, pra the practice of Catholicism is diminishing. A lot of people, they are no more going to attend Mass on Sunday. A lot of people don't confess anymore. A lot of people, they are very easily in uh, going against the law of the church. That's happened not only in the state, it happened throughout all the, practically all the world. To the guardians of the faith, like the 74-year-old Silvio Cardinal Odi, head of the Catholic clergy, the church is in danger of losing one of its most prized possessions, unity. And that is the reason because the church insists the Holy Father insists on any occasion, particularly when he's traveling throughout the world, he's insisting, insisting that the Catholics should obey to the church, should go to the Mass on Sunday, should go to confession, should receive the sacraments, should in their private life, should obey to the law, to the law of the church and love of God. But you see. We are just preaching for that, we are just working for that, and we hope that the future will be better. The light that is Christ still burns deep within the heart and soul of the faithful. But 20 years after Vatican II promised to open the church to new ideas, there's confusion and turmoil. The church that 350 years ago condemned Galileo for saying the sun, not the earth, is at the center of the universe, is still considering the case. The church that earlier in this century condemned modernism as heresy has yet to fully accept it. The message still carried from here to the world's more than 800 million Catholics still bears the aura of papal infallibility a message no longer universally welcomed or followed. O oh Lord, be my rock of strength. You are my rock. For your name's sake, you will lead and guide me. Pastoral Productions proudly presents Rock of Ages with Father Joe Jagodensky. Sponsored by the Archdiocese of Milwaukee through the cooperation of WKTI-FM. The Lord is my constant companion. There is no need that he cannot fulfill. Whether the gospel message may be universal. But in America, the confrontation between the modern world and the traditional church was unavoidable. That's true in Milwaukee, heartland of America, heartland of the church in America.
Today, 20 years after Vatican II, the church in America is in that most painful of periods, a period of transition. Many have lost the faith. Others have found it in new ways. No longer is Catholicism in America described in terms of conformity. No longer is the church strictly a pyramid of authority. For increasing numbers has become a circle of equality, what Vatican II called the people of God. Twenty years ago, this might have been mistaken for a meeting of Protestant holy rollers, not Catholic charismatics speaking in tongues. Almost one in every four Americans is a Catholic. Many have accepted change in the practice of their faith, but many others are troubled by what they feel is a loss of meaning, of mystery. Perhaps more than any other, this was a church of immigrants, which embraced American ideals while holding on to a tradition that sprang from old world ideas. During the first half of this century, nowhere were Catholics more loyal to the Pope, more obedient to Rome, than were Catholics in America. And for Catholics in an often hostile America, the Church was more than a religion. It was a way of life. That sense of community remains strong in Milwaukee, a city of immigrants that's 35% Catholic, a population that reflects the past times and tensions affecting Catholic life in America today. The easy stereotypes are no longer possible and were never true. But beneath the familiar images was a Catholic culture, a belief system anchored in the teachings of the church. Who made you? Who did God. Why did God make you? Genevieve. You go to heaven. You go to heaven, all right? The very first place you think of, where's God's home? Up in heaven. Up in heaven, all right. What is, where else is his home? In our hearts. In our hearts. All right. How do we know that the heart is in our hearts? What do we have? Um, a soul. A soul. All right. So, who is our greatest leader? Tina? Jesus. All right. Jesus. Why is Jesus our greatest leader? Why is he... The lessons of the old catechism haven't been entirely forgotten in this parish school. Not yet. Is what you're teaching in religion class here typical of what is taught in Milwaukee's Catholic schools? Sorry to say, but no. I think Our Lady Queen of Peace School upholds the magisterium of the church, and we teach exactly what comes from Rome. We go through the church with the sacraments, and plus we have the Pope, who is uh, Christ on earth, and that is something that we have to uh, follow. It's a blind obedience, and at times you often ask, why? Why do I have to do that? Question authority. It's not for us to question. Not to question, but to keep the faith has from earliest times been a purpose of the pilgrimage. So it is for this band of travelers who've come 5,000 miles from Milwaukee. They are moved by the power of piety and by their concern for what's happening to the church in America. That's what's brought them here, to the Vatican. They are modern pilgrims with some old ideas about the fundamentals of the faith. 
about what it means to walk in the footsteps of Christ. Here we are in this venerable and great cathedral, reaffirming our faith in the angels, God's created beings, these great intelligences and powers whom we call angeli, from the Greek word angelos, which means messenger. The message brought by a 70-year-old Milwaukee priest, Monsignor Alphonse Popek, to this chapel in St. Peter's Basilica is a pledge of allegiance to the hierarchy. He and his followers, including Joanne Kuffel, are members of Catholics United for the Faith, CUF. Their voice in America is small, but it is heard in the Vatican. And when we think of this spot, so close as we are to the Holy Father, we could think of him as the messenger of the gospel. He is the messenger of the Lord in our times. Someday we shall call him Pope John Paul the Magnificent because of his work in solidifying the faith. He has gone to the roots of the church, to the people, so that if any of them have been misled, they might be brought back to the faith. If you were to speak about the church in America to a cardinal of the church in Rome, what would you say to him? I would say your eminence. I come here with a heart full of sadness. There are many of us in the United States who love and defend the teachings of the church. We are loyal to His Holiness, Pope John Paul II, and we lament what has happened in our country. We find our good orders of nuns in shambles. We find our priests, the vocations are down, not lost, but down because of our seminaries. We find that our people are confused, hurt, and upset. What I fear is that we already have in the United States the American Catholic Church. And it is certainly not to be confused the Roman Catholic Church. I fear that we're already in a schism. Uh, it not be, may not be accepted as such, but the point that must be made is that a Roman Catholic is one who is obedient to, is subservient to uh, the magisterium of the church, the faith and the morals, as it was taught, as it is being taught, as it always will be taught. Okay, Listen up. Listen up. Verse blue is expandable. What's being taught on a Saturday afternoon in this classroom is as much as anything what's dividing American Catholics and testing the teachings of the church. Okay, ready for anyone else? Okay, second clue, female organ. Okay, is everyone? Oh. Got one group? Do we need another clue? Oh. Yep. Oh, no. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. You were the first up. All right. Let's do it. This voluntary sex education program sponsored by the Milwaukee Archdiocese, conducted by parents for 8th and 9th graders, is called BYS, Valuing Your Sexuality. In style and in substance, BYS offends some Catholics, especially members of CUF who've sent this program to Rome for review. But to many others, BYS represents an effort to bring their children and their church into the modern world the purpose of Vatican II, a world in which the facts of life seem more complex than the simpler age-old rules of the church. During this weekend program, Catholic parents must confront a wide range of questions on the minds of their children and of the church. Again, the question was, is it okay to use birth control? 
Is it a sin to have sexual intercourse before marriage? Should gay people be denied certain rights? What if some of your parents told you about masturbation? Do you know how the church feels about abortion? Are there any cases where you think abortion is acceptable? We've got two types of questions we know from the question box. One is fact question and one is moral discussion questions. And this is what we would call a moral opinion. It's an opinion. And so we would like to discuss this question. Is it immoral to get pregnant when you are not married? Once there were only fact, not opinion questions. And the answers were clearly defined. Now even the church's most basic moral teachings are up for discussion and to the individual conscience. The question is, is it okay to use birth control? Would you say? It's an opinion. It's an opinion question. And, and some of you may say yes and some of you may feel no. There's no right or no wrong. Okay, my, what I, what my I've guess. given you is like some definitions of birth control some types of things that can be used for birth control, some questions that people considering birth control have to consider, and then what the church says about birth control. Consider the types, consider the questions involving the reasons behind birth control, and then go according to your conscience and accept the responsibility for your own decision. So let me go back to this question. Is it okay to use birth control? Now, what's your answer? Since Vatican II as never before, the question has arisen. When to follow church teachings or conscience? That's certainly true for these Catholics. We begin our prayer this evening in the name of God, our Creator, Redeemer, and Spirit of love within us all. Dignity is a national organization of gay Catholics that challenges both the established thinking and the sensitivities of the church in Rome and in America. It's a controversial voice, yet it may speak to the concerns of many Catholics. If our faith is not something we can celebrate and something we can share with one another because it's something that's important to us, is it worth having at all? And sure, we'd like the big miracles to happen. But I think the miracle that is happening in our midst is the fact that we can gather to celebrate. The miracle that we can be here to support one another with love in dignity. We're not letting people walk all over us. We're not trying to fall into traps. And that's a source of hope for us. Is it a risk for you to celebrate this mass? Yes. There's the hate mail that comes in regularly. Uh, I've been rather open in, in speaking about my involvement with dignity. Um, many people have respected me for it. Many people, once I get to talk to them on a one-to-one -one level, recognize the fact that it is something good that is being done. Others say, how can you do this horrible thing? Uh, you're, you're with sinners. And my comment for them is, we're all sinners. Father Steve Scherer, class of 1979 is a graduate of Milwaukee's St. Francis Seminary. Like a great many priests in recent years, he's caught between the Vatican II idea of a people's church and the tradition of the church. Rome, I think, is, is trying to, to grab power again. Perhaps it feels it's, it's lost power since the Second Vatican Council. As a priest, do you feel that you have to look over your shoulder at Rome, that they're watching? I guess I do feel they are. It, it has a certain amount of fear associated with it. I, um, I like priesthood very much. I feel I'm doing a very good job as a priest. I'm able to touch a lot of people's lives, and I think by my ministry, make people realize that the church is more than just a, lot of set of, just a set of rules and just a, a big power or authority figure that, that sits over in Rome in the Vatican and, and think up rules all day that people have to follow. Who do you have to fear? The cuff people are, are a big influence. Uh, I've been verbally attacked by them. I've been attacked in writing by them. I was told that my name was sent to Rome. And when I thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> what have I done so badly that my name has gone to Rome for? Um, sent to Rome by members of cuff? Members of cuff. 
if the clergy, and naturally, uh, if the Lucifer, Satan, whatever you wish to call him, wishes to get again at the church, they're going to go through, shall we say, the quote, the educated ones. And so it would be our priests, our nuns, whom we would normally trust. And if they're trained incorrectly in the seminaries, in the convents, then it is the ordinary layman, the laity, who will save the church. Because basically they will have kept the faith. Members of Cuff, like Milwaukee's Joanne Cuffel, regularly inform the Vatican about those in America they think are not keeping the faith. If Rome has spoken, that is the answer. When the Holy Father gives these directives, whether they're ex cathedra, which means they must be believed, or just in his simple elocutions, what separates us? We have but one pope, and we do not have 15, 20 popes in our various parishes. There is but one pope. And so through all this turbulent time, you must remain in that piece of the bark where Peter is. In one way, Pope John Paul II himself is a symbol of change. The first non-Italian pope in almost 500 years, a Polish priest who's captured the world's attention with his travels and style. If for many in the crowd, he's become more a personality than an authority figure, that's not true for members of Cuff, or for members of the clergy, like Monsignor Popek. For them, the pilgrimage is an act of devotion But for other Catholics, especially Americans, this Pope has increasingly become a center of controversy. Many in and out of the clergy believe he's come to represent resistance to the spirit, if not the letter of Vatican II, an attempt to return to the authoritarian ways of the old church. Every Wednesday he's in Rome, the Pope extends to a general audience his blessing and a lecture on one of the tenets of the faith. Dear brothers and sisters, we are considering today the spiritual life of married couples, taking as our point of departure the teaching contained in Humane Vitae. The subject is Humane Vitae, human life, the Church's teaching against artificial contraception, but the issue is authority. After Vatican II, it was widely expected that the Church would change its position on birth control. Instead, against the overwhelming recommendation of a papal commission, in 1968 it was reaffirmed. Pope John Paul II has reaffirmed it again and again. This Church teaching may have caused the most serious crisis for papal authority since Luther and the Protestant Reformation. No issue has so tested the faith of American Catholics. And in America, no papal teaching has been so widely disobeyed. I remember Pope Paul VI, when he was so attacked, really, for this human vitae, he said, yes, I know that many, many, many Catholics, they are practicing the birth control. But in that sense, we can't, we can't approve because they are, they, are, they are doing this. The principle is that we can't go against the life. We are not the master of the life. The life exists, you must respect the life. So the birth control is certainly a bad thing. Even a lot of people, like Catholics, are doing it. And uh, I can add that we are the most reasonable men. When a person comes to confess to me, he say, I have 10 abortions, I tell him, don't start again. I will not put him in prison. I will not uh, punish him. He said, don't start. Stop it. What can we do? It's difficult. I understand. It's very difficult. That's one of the difficult issues for young Catholics who must decide what to do at a time when Catholic universities like Marquette in Milwaukee have become more open to diverse theological views. There was a time 30 years ago when there were no conservative Catholics uh, or liberal Catholics. There were just Catholics. We were a monolith 
And we simply all believe just about the same thing, from birth control to bingo. We were just all into the uh, same type of belief system. And now, obviously, that isn't the case. And so you're growing up in a world where that hasn't been the case. You're post-Vatican II babies. And so you grew up in a world where there have been, you've seen bishops have disagreed with one another, and popes have corrected previous popes, and uh, theologians are classified now as more liberal, conservative, etc. And uh, the question I'd like to hear a little feedback on is, what does it mean to you uh, to be a Catholic? Yes? Such questions have taken on new meaning for students and for professors like Dan McGuire, a moral theologian whose very presence at Marquette is a moral issue for Catholics who see critical inquiry as threatening the church. What, what was the effect of Humanae Vitae on Catholics in America? I think it was the a strong realization that the church can make a mistake. And we were very naive in this country. We were very, um, very obedient type Catholics. There was strong conviction that grew up in the 60s that, that the church was wrong on birth control, that this was an import from some other vision of life. And there was every reason to believe that the Vatican would even recognize that. When they didn't do it, uh, I think practice then separated and people began to act on their own consciences. The use of, of the confessional changed. And I think a number of people felt if they could blow this one, they could blow a lot of things. And so there was a, a certain disenchantment, profound disenchantment that came into the church with the Omane Vitae. McGuire was a priest for 15 years. He and his wife Marjorie, also a theologian, are perhaps most controversial for their view that pro-choice on abortion is a legitimate Catholic position, in open conflict with the teaching authority of the church. As Catholics, as moral theologians, aren't you required to follow and obey the teachings of the church? Yes, we are, uh, but that's a very ambiguous term. The teaching of the church is kind of like a greased pig that runs through a lot of conversation these days, as though it were as simply determined as the rules of the National Football League saying there are only 10 yards to, to make a first down, that's what you need. And, you know, you don't even have to be newfangled liberal Catholics who are theologians to... Uh, know this you can go back to the catechism we all learned as children that told us that we only had to take as absolutely true any dogmas that the pope proclaimed as infallible well most of the things the pope says he does not proclaim as infallible so that means that if he's not infallible he's fallible that means he can be wrong so it means somebody has the obligation in the interests of the church to try to point out where they see he's wrong and that's what we feel we have to do what about this pope, John Paul II? Does he represent the thinking of most Catholics in America? No, I, I think this pope is extraordinary in his criticisms of capitalism and communism and saying a pox on both those houses because neither one of them really take care of the poor and the weak. I think his sense of uh, that in general has been very good. But then on other issues, he, he's very inconsistent. He's the most politically active pope in recent memory, and yet he doesn't want uh, other politicians to get involved. I think he's aided and abetted those who are trying to really wage a counterattack on the Second Vatican Council. And on what I've been calling the pelvic issues, uh, he's, I think he's antiquarian uh, on that. What, what are the pelvic issues? Oh, the issues like birth control, abortion, uh, sterilization, sexual ethics, homosexuality. Uh, he brings an enormous rigidity to those issues, and he can't get off those issues. I mean, he's constantly reasserting them. Even though, as a matter of fact, in the Catholic Church, you have pluralism on all those issues. No one views it in the simplistic terms that the Pope does not know one, but, but most theologians are not in that simplistic mode. The big news is that the Catholic Church is not monolithic. It is diverse and pluralistic. It also is important to note that obedience is not a gospel ideal. It is a Vatican ideal, but it's not a gospel ideal. You just have to search those gospels forever, and you'll still never find, by this will they know that you are my disciples, that you obey one another. It's just not there. Is there room for the views of uh, moral theologians like Dan McGuire at Marquette and the Church in America? If by the Church of America you mean the American Catholic Church, there is much room for him. He could be a shining luminary in that church, he and his wife. There'd be much room. But in the Roman Catholic Church, the church founded by Christ, there should be no room for him. Oh, we can pray for his soul. We can ask that the chasm be closed, but will it be closed?
No part of the church has been more obedient than women religious. This traditional picture of convent life survives in Milwaukee, but barely. Since Vatican II, one-third, 60,000 American sisters and nuns have left their orders, and of those who remain, half are more than 60 years old. It's a rejection of the past and a challenge to the future of the church. At the convent today, signs of change can be seen and heard. I think the big failure was that while we may have spoken, in some instances, a sort of prophetic word to society, that our big failure has been that we have not done that to the church. And while we may have tried to be sensitive to the needs of the poor, we have not created a church in solidarity with the poor. And while we may be for liberating people from oppression and from all of the things that keep them from being fully human, uh, we haven't created that kind of church. No group responded more dramatically to the changes of Vatican II than the women of the church. Sister Betty Walcott joined her order 40 years ago. She's kept her vows, but broken with tradition, in defiance of what the Pope might think. Well, I, I think he thinks we're far too liberal, um, that we are not obedient uh, little people. Um, who should be um, doing certain churchy works, um, works that he considers more appropriate to us. It's difficult. I don't spend a lot of time reflecting on the Holy Father. It's not a big deal for me, really, because um, I feel that the church, um, I can't wait for the institutional church. Things I'd never get anything done if I did that. But one recent Vatican guideline says that women religious should return to wearing religious dress and living in religious houses. Well, of course, if you put out things like that, guidelines like that, you're asking for non-compliance. I mean, that's not how, how we see our, that's not a real value in our life. How do you think that the views that I hear you expressing would be received in the Vatican? Well, I've written my letters to the Vatican. I mean, I, I feel that we need to challenge the Vatican if the Vatican needs to be challenged. I mean, it is not, it's a human institution. Um, does it need to be challenged? Oh, yes, indeed it does. I'm saddened by the kind of um, crackdowns that are coming out of the Vatican. You know, crackdowns on the religious orders and trying to push them back into wearing the habit and some old forms of governance and so on that they've moved beyond at the invitation of Rome at the time of the Vatican Council. Will that kind of uh, thing be accepted, do you think, in America? That kind of crackdown by Rome? According to the women that I'm in dialogue with in religious orders and the lay women who support, who are working together, we hopefully will not let that happen, that we will stand in solidarity and uh, oppose that kind of uh, intimidation and terrorism. It just is not Christian, it's not gospel, it's immoral. Marianne Iim was a sister for 25 years. She's left her order, but not the church. We're not doing it to be schismatic. We're not doing it to be disobedient. We're genuinely, authentically trying to find expression to our Christian faith. And we are church. We are woman church, that other half that has not been heard from for 2,000 years. Uh, what would you say to a woman who says that uh, she feels unequal in the church? All I have to say is when God created man, he created him first. I, I mean, that's the priority. I can't, and nor can you, nor can anyone change that priority. But what some women are talking about is wanting to be ordained as priests. Oh, you, oh, well, the ordination to the priesthood, we'll have to hold back on that. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. 
And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Okay. Any questions? The place and role of women is an issue not only in the convent, but here in the seminary where women have been traditionally excluded and where the Vatican believes they should be excluded again. For now, women can study here, but some, like Kathy Vandenberg, married and the mother of two, want more. To be what the Vatican says no woman can ever be, a priest. I don't think God cares whether we're male or female. I think we're all equal in the sight of God. I see no problem with it. What does it mean? to be a Catholic today in America. I ask myself, what does that mean to be a Roman Catholic woman? You know, I don't know what that means. I really don't know. I have to ask myself, why do I stay within the Catholic Church? Why do I continue to bump heads? Why do I continue to be in a church that oftentimes says, I don't want you, Kathy? Because if they really wanted me, they would welcome me with open arms. What do your husband and children think about your wanting to be ordained a priest? It's not easy for them. Sometimes my children have been harassed. They say, I saw your mother on TV when you were at the cathedral, uh, at that prayer service outside the ordinations. And they say, Mom, I wish you wouldn't do that. But I say to them, I have to do it. I have to do it for you. I have to do it for my grandchildren. Because if we don't do something positive, things will never change. It's not easy. It's not easy for them, and it's not easy for me. I'm alone sometimes. Do you take a risk speaking out this way? Yes. I was, I had to ask in my heart whether or not I was even going to talk to you. Because after your, you go back to New York or Boston, I'm still here. I don't know what people are going to say, but I know I have to do something. And I'm continuing to talk on out and say, it has to stop. It has to stop. Sexism has to stop. The Pope says the ferment has to stop and has ordered investigations of American seminaries and religious orders. The Vatican is alarmed by the diminishing numbers of priests and nuns, by what it sees as the erosion of discipline, as the challenge to its authority. At Milwaukee Seminary, as throughout the country, enrollments are in serious and steady decline. One of the major reasons is mandatory celibacy, a vow that many priests believe should at least be optional. In the past 20 years, more than 10,000 American priests have married, have renounced church law that makes celibacy a requirement of the priesthood. Among them, Jim Groppy, a graduate of Milwaukee Seminary, who after 18 years a priest, became a bus driver. I know too many married men that uh, would make better priests than single men they tell me uh, categorically that in order to be effective, you must be a single male. It's, well, Christ never thought that way. Eleven of the twelve apostles were married. I mean, if St. Peter were exist uh, alive today and were to present himself for ordination to the church, uh, they would tell him, we can't use you. You've got a wife. For Grappi, now president of his union local, the Vatican is to blame for the gap between Catholic teaching and Catholic practice that because there is a superabundance of laws, people are sinning because they think they're violating the laws and yet they can't live in accordance with them. And that's what has happened in the church. It has been here for 2,000 years and uh, apparently some of the um, single male canon lawyers in the Vatican had nothing to do but create more and more laws. And those laws are bad. They make people sin. And um, they're hardly Christian. 
As a priest, Jim Grappi fought secular authority during the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Today, he's still fighting authority in the bus company and in the church. But also the other fact is the, the question of authoritarianism, especially in America. We are not good at accepting authoritarianism. We insist on, on participation, participating in decision making. We're taught that from our earliest years. And when the, when the church tells us, no, we can't exercise those rights in the city of God, but we can exercise them in the, in the secular city, one begins to scratch their, their head and we say, well, there's something good in the secular city that is not good in the city of God. And maybe the city of God ought to be changed. Do you think there's anyone in the Vatican who would share your views? No. I don't know of anyone that would. But I believe in it. I've always believed in democracy. And I believe that God speaks. See, the church, this, this, the, 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 God speaks not only through the, the, through the clergy, through that authoritarian structure, but it speaks through the people. And the people's voice is not able to be heard because of the authoritarian structure of the church. For the church in America, this is the center of authority. The American bishops, successors to the apostles, the loyal followers of Jesus. To the Vatican, especially the sacred congregation for the doctrine of the faith, once the holy office of the Inquisition, they haven't always been loyal enough. In recent years, the Vatican has at least twice ordered that the actions of certain bishops be investigated with the secret findings delivered to Rome, revealing a conflict between the churches of Rome and America that has few parallels in modern church history. Bishop Walter Sullivan of Richmond, investigated by Rome, in part it's believed for writing the preface to a book on Catholics and homosexuality. Archbishop Raymond Hunthausen of Seattle, investigated by Rome, it's believed on matters of doctrine and perhaps because of his active opposition to the nuclear arms race. Jesuit priest William Callahan was silenced for two years on orders from Rome. It's obviously a very painful thing to be silenced on areas that you feel very strongly about, as was my own case, my own 10-year advocacy of the ordination of women and of equality in the church. But I also understand that in some sense that's a compliment that there is great worry developing that the views you espouse are starting to gain a real credible foothold and therefore institutional church tries to slow it down. Uh, it means that you've become quite threatening. The threat is a church divided between Rome and America, between American Catholics themselves, a threat to traditional authority and how it's exercised. Perhaps more than anywhere else in the world, in America, bishops are caught in the whirlwind of change, and nowhere is it being felt more strongly than in places like Milwaukee, where Rembert Weekland is archbishop. Probably the hardest part of being Catholic is to keep the diversity that is possible and needed because of cultural, because of traditional uh, and historical influences, and at the same time to keep a bond of unity. So that tension between needed diversity and unity has always been true of the church, always will be true of the church, and certainly now is uh, one of the characteristics of the church. It's going to get worse instead of better. Can a bishop in America today lead and expect to be followed? I think so. I think so. Can a pope lead and expect to be obeyed in America? I think so. There I, I think we all have to face the same question. And that is um, probably uh, the kind of authority that previously we had in the church where you said it and people begrudgingly did it is not with us anymore. And where we rely more on the intrinsic persuasiveness of the argument itself uh, and that causes a new kind of leadership and to me, there has been a change in that leadership, which demands uh, more vision, 
or inspiration and a, a different way of going about it. But the church, like the world, the society we live in, is still looking for leaders. Many American Catholics in the clergy and out of the clergy see the Vatican putting pressure on the church in America to be more disciplined, more orthodox, more obedient, if you will, to the doctrine and to the hierarchy of the church. Yes, I agree. And uh, again, I think it's not only with the states that we are using, that the Vatican, the Holy See is using this method. Because for a certain moment, after Council, Vatican Council II, it was a little bit disappointment. Everybody was thinking that they should, they would think what they like. They are, were not obliged to obey. They were free to do what they, they would prefer. And it was a mistake. Particularly for us, for the Catholic Church, we are a hierarchical organism. And the obedience for us is very, very, very important. I would say that we can't go on without obedience. Because if we are permitting to everybody to act according to what he thinks, <laughs> we are wrong, certainly. We are no more a Catholic Church. We will be a lot of churches. What's being heard are the voices of true believers who with equal faith and conviction no longer always believe the same things. The Pope still commands the world's imagination and the respect of millions of Catholics, but no longer can he command unquestioning obedience. What may seem disobedient to some in the church is for others a living out of their faith, an act of conscience, a belief in the spirit of Vatican II. What's being questioned in America is a faith imported from another time, another place. Perhaps the conflict was inevitable between the old European idea of monarchy, even a papal monarchy, and American ideas of discussion, even dissent. It would be untrue to report a new schism in the Roman Catholic Church. That last happened in the 16th century. But as the 21st century approaches, the split in the church is serious because of the power of faith. Vatican II raised the question without providing the answer, whether the power of the church is in the Pope, the vicar of Christ who speaks for God on earth, or whether that authority is to be shared with all Catholics, the people of God. The power struggle among American Catholics is also a fight for the future of the church that isn't likely to end soon. The battle, which is focused on abortion, contraception, capitalism, and nuclear weapons, will next address an issue that could become the most controversial of all, as American bishops prepare a new pastoral letter on the role of women in society and in the church. And the Pope, in a surprise announcement, has called ranking bishops to Rome this fall to examine and evaluate Vatican II. Conservative Catholics hope this will be a first step in backing away from Vatican II in order to restore discipline and unity to a church divided. Next week on Frontline, on the anniversary of the fall of South Vietnam to the Communists, a report on the U.S. Army ten years after. The United States Army today, can it win a war? There has never been a better army than the one America has today. I think it's a false optimism. I think the army as an institution is really unsure of itself. From victory in World War II to the pullout in Vietnam, America's ability to win on the battlefield has come under fire. The prevailing notion of the U.S. Army is, gee, we screwed up in Vietnam. We have to clean up our act. And what are the limits of military power? We have a responsibility to tell the president, and to some degree tell the American people, the, what is the limits of the military possible? What can we do and what can't we do? I was at a conference at the State Department and I was going through this litany that you find so disturbing. We can't do this, we can't do that, we can't do that. And finally the ambassador stood up and said, what in the hell can you do? 
And it's just in a res quick response, said, well, we can kill people and destroy things in the name of the United States. He said, my God, you can't say that. But that's what we do. <laughs> you know? And if you don't want that done, don't send in the military. Don't send in the military and then wring your hands and say, oh, my God, you've, you've hurt someone. Of course we did. I mean, that's what you sent us in there to do. The program is called The American Way of War, next week on Frontline. I'm Judy Woodruff. Good night. For a transcript of this program, please send $4 to Frontline, Box 322, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. Major funding for Frontline was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. For video cassette information about Frontline, write to PBS Video, Box 8092, Washington, D.C., 20024.